The last uh, Sunday school class for, for March, remember that next week we will have something going on during Sunday school, and I hope you all come to it. It'll be a time of testimonies and hymn singing for Easter. It'll be a really special time, but there won't be any regular Sunday school class. The week after that, we're going to start our new classes, which I'm excited about. Um, but let's, let's pray, and then we'll get into this last um, Sunday school hour. God, I thank you for our church. Lord, you have many people in this place, and I thank you for that. And Lord, you've given us love for each other, and I pray that you'd increase it more and more. Lord, would you help us to respect one another, to have mercy and compassion for one another, to have humility and gentleness toward one another. And I pray that in all things we do as a church that you would be pleased. Would you guide us? Help us not to to go out on our own, but to trust and follow you for your name's sake. Amen. Um, Today I'm going to start out the lesson answering a couple questions that were asked at the end of last lesson, and we didn't have time to get to them. So the first question is one about eternal security. Um, The the question is, is 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 a believer's salvation secure? for eternity, or is there some way where they can lose it? And my view, and I believe that the other elders share this, is that a believer's salvation is not something that can be lost. A believer's salvation is a gift from God, thank God, and not something that we can earn. And since it's not something that we can earn, it's not something we can lose by sinning too much or not being good enough. The Holy Spirit is is in us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance for salvation. That's Ephesians 1.14. And salvation will not be taken away from those who are believers in Christ. Now, <clears throat> our salvation is not by works that we do. It's by grace through faith. That's Ephesians 2.8. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift. But I want to emphasize that it is through faith. It's by grace through faith, a person without faith will not be saved. So here's where some of the arguments and some of the things between people come in. Calvinists say that if someone turns away from God, they never had faith to begin with. They may have seemed like they were believers, um, and they might have thought that they were believers, but they never were. Arminians, let's not do that yet. Oh, never mind, it's not up there. Um, Arminians will say that someone um, might have had true faith at one time, but they turned away from it, from believing in Jesus, and they rejected their salvation. Either way, both sides say that only those who have faith in Jesus will be saved. Everyone who believes in, uh, in eternal security believes that this is the condition on which it's based, that people have faith. Years ago in our church constitution, it was written down that we wouldn't argue about Calvinism versus Arminianism. That's not in the constitution anymore, but I think it's a good practice that we should continue not to argue about such things that are um, too above our head, right? Um, There's a reason, there is a reason for us to be completely confident in the salvation of those who trust in Jesus. Um, There's nothing that could take that away or take us out of his hand. And there's no reason to be confident in the salvation of those who don't trust Jesus and have faith in him. And we don't know always. We don't always know enough to be sure which person is which. God is the judge of those who have faith. So to sum up, the believer, the one who has faith, is secure in the hand of God for all eternity. Not because of what they do, but because of what Christ did on the cross, and for that, we can be thankful and be secure in our faith. Does anybody have questions about that or or comments? Yes, Mike? Yeah. Mike coming up. I'm sorry, who? Mike. Mike Mike coming up. Oh, Mike. Mike. (laughs) Mike. (laughs) Gotcha, thank you. I would just mention that, uh, yes, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, you know, 
by grace through faith. Uh, anyway, I think it's important to, to mention too that uh, the repentance is almost it's the same one side of the same uh, one side of the same coin, faith and uh, repentance. They kind of uh, merge, and they're both shown as necessary to believing faith. Completely agree. Yep. Okay, I do believe that once saved, always saved. However, those who are saved show the fruits of salvation. And if someone's not doing that, then they need to be called to repentance and to renew their, their trust and faith in Jesus. Um, and you know that's, that's the problem that some people have with this is that they look at someone and they say, hey, you're not living for Christ, you know? Um, and so they need to be called back to that because those who are truly saved will gradually and more and more show the fruits of salvation and the love of Christ. So I'm, I just, that's the other side of it. And no, they're not earning their salvation through that but they're showing that they are saved by living for Jesus. Yes, they will show it because that's what God does in a person who has been saved. But thank you. All right, Jeff. Michael, can we put that uh, organizational chart up? Two weeks ago, we had body part analogies. Last week, I spared you. We're back to body part analogies today. All right. So um, the church is an organization with many parts. In my office, I have this anatomic chart. And on that chart, you can see all the different body parts, where they're located, what they do, and what happens if they malfunction. This, in a sense, is the same thing. Now. What's important is, is that chart in my office and this chart, they're not power charts. There's no part that's more important than the other. What needs to happen in order for an organization to work well is that it has to have structure. And so that's what this is about. You need checks and balances. If I eat too many chocolate covered peanuts, my stomach says to my brain, I don't think that was a good idea. So within our body, we have checks and balances as we should have in the church. Initially, when Karen and I came to this church and I heard that it was a congregational church, I thought, I'm not sure I understand how that can work or how it could be efficient. But I've become very enamored by the organizational structure of this church with respect to the congregation. But the reason I have is not because of the structure, but because of the congregation. You guys are wise and engaged, godly men and women who speak to issues. You have opinions. You have lots of opinions. That's good. That's okay. We need that. You oversee and affirm the elders' direction and the election of of deacon, or the, you affirm the deacons and the pastors. Um, so you have a tremendous function for this church. But what cannot happen in any organization is for a large committee to micromanage. It's too unwielding and it leads to inertia. So what we need to do as a congregation is we need to allow people to fail. Allow yourselves to fail. We need to try things or else we become stagnant. So if we say we have done it this way forever and we should continue to do it this way, maybe we should rethink that idea. In summary, the church is an organization with many parts. No part more important than another, but each essential for the healthy functioning of the body. I believe everyone can find a 
their spot on this chart. Partner with one of these boxes and see what they would have you do. And by the way, there are plenty of safeguards to keep the gallbladder from becoming an eyeball. All right? Call me for coffee and pastry. I'm buying. Okay. By the way, this, this chart is not... Um, this is a work in progress. Oh. And uh, it's just an attempt to describe how things happen right now. And some of the things are not how they happen right now. So... For instance, the EPT isn't really under the deacons. Um, we just put them there for now. So it's, this is not perfect, and this has not been published. But the reason why we bring it up is because um, a lot of people have questions. Where do I go if I have this question? Or who do I take this to? Or you know th that sort of thing. And so it's good to know how things work in this um, in this chart. So I see we, we have a question over here, Bob. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, could you please go down that chart on each column there? And it, it's very difficult to read and to go down and list maybe at the top and then left, right, middle. Yeah. At the, at okay, the top is the person who should be there, which is Jesus. Um, and then the congregation. So we are a congregational church. It's not like... Um, there's a pope who makes all the decisions and then bishops and <laughs> cardinals and things. Um, the, the congregation is the one who sets the direction for the church and um, elects people. The elders, according to scripture, um, are the job of the overseer, which we call elders, to direct the affairs of the church. And so um, that's, that's our job. Down in the bylaws, the senior pastor is a part of the elders. So I'm not above them in any way. I'm a part of them. The reason why it's um, put like that is so you can see that I, as a senior pastor, am over the, the other um, paid positions in the church. So on the left-hand side, it's the senior pastor, and down below that is the family pastor, youth pastor, administrative assistant, and secretary. And then... Um, the admin board is the second to the, to the left. And the admin board does a lot of things, um, like practical, detail-oriented stuff. They take care of the budget, um, making the budget the treasurer. Uh, Jan Cooper is under the admin board. And then the finance committee is an ad hoc committee that, that serves the admin board. Um, and then under them are the trustees, the people who take care of our building. And the way it currently works, um, Keith, our custodian, uh, reports to the trustees. To the, the next one, the deacons, um, they have a scriptural role. Um, in 1 Timothy 3, you can read that. There's a qualifications for deacons and, and what they do. The word deacon means servant. And so they take care of um, the bodily needs of our people, of our congregation. And uh, they oversee the care team. So we have a, a great care team right now and they're doing a great job. And the deacons oversee their ministry. Like I said, the EPT comes under that and that's, didn't know where to put that. So, But we wanted to recognize that's a part of our church. Um, the EPT stands for Emergency Preparedness Team. They um, take care of the security as well as if someone had a, a health crisis here. And then the GMT, the Global Missions Team, is over on the far right. Are there, do you have any questions for Jeff? Hold, hold on. Yeah, I would love if, you, if the deacons shared more and the admin board too, if you would like. Yeah, I, w I was going to say uh, one other thing that uh, is critical is that we also um, <clears throat> administer the benevolent fund, and that is used to take care of the uh, practical and financial needs of the, of the church body. Right. I, I didn't mention everything that everybody does. That would take all, um, that, that would be a long time. And uh, I think all of our teams do a great job at what they do. And um, 
and so yes, the deacons they they do a lot. The admin board does a lot as well, and the elders um, do a lot. But we don't. The, the elders aren't here to take other people's responsibilities, um, you know. And so this it takes a lot to have a church function the way it should. And so we're thankful for what everybody does. Phil, just a minute. I'm sorry. Okay, a good, a good place to go to find more specifics about what the different... Uh, well, it's, so, so Tim uh, is going to cover this about okay. the specifics is the by, of... Is the bylaws, right? Yes, yep. yes, thank you. You can look at the bylaws or the church constitution. They are on our website, and if you'd like a physical copy, uh, tell the office, and we could definitely print it off. I think every covenant partner should, um, and, and people who aren't covenant partners, should read those things um they sound boring um but they're they're not i think they're they're really helpful to know how things work so i'll expand a little bit on uh, the role of the elders and deacons and we'll talk about uh, women as deacons um, as we've been talking about in the bylaws there's good descriptions of what the elders and deacons are charged with. Um, the elders are basically spiritual overseers of the church. Um, they are called to oversee the church of God and protect it, and provide spiritual guidance. Jesus is the head of the church and we are a local expression of his body. The elders are to submit to his leadership and uh, therefore we will not knowingly contradict of biblical principles, um, and we'll strive to discern God's plan for Lockwood uh, through prayer and study of Scripture. Um, the, the deacons, on the other hand, are charged with taking care of the practical needs of the church um, as um, Dan, <laughs> drawing a blank there, Dan, sorry. As Dan mentioned, they are in charge of the Benevolent Fund, which uh, has helped many people over the years uh, who have come to a, a time when they need some, some aid. Um, they're not required to be able to teach or preach, uh, which is uh, a difference between a deacon and an elder. And uh, they're selected by the congregation, as it was in Acts 6, when the uh, dispute arose about uh, the uh, Hellenistic Christians being overlooked uh, in the distribution of food. So according to our bylaws, the deacons are men who are called to be servant leaders who attend to the church's uh, practical needs. And um, therefore they're responsible for uh, many areas, including uh, communion supply and anything else that uh, might come along. As far as women as deacons, uh, scripture is not completely clear as to whether or not a woman can serve in the office of a deacon. Um, the statement that deacons are men to be worthy of a respect um, and the qualification of the husband of but, but one wife, these are both in 1 Timothy 3, would seem to disqualify women from serving as deacons. However, some interpret uh, 1 Timothy 3.11 which is between those two statements, uh, which says, in the same way the wives are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Uh, some consider that to re be referring to women because the Greek word translated wives can also be translated women. Um, according to this, Paul is referring not to deacons' wives, but to women who serve as deacons. In Romans 16, uh, Paul refers to Phoebe as a deacon or servant. It's unclear, though, whether Paul is saying Phoebe is a deacon or whether he's just saying she's a servant. In the early church, women servants cared for the sick, the poor, strangers, and those in prison, and they instructed women and children. Phoebe may not have had the official designation of deacon, but Paul thought enough of her to entrust her with carrying his letter to the Romans to the church in Rome. Clearly, he saw her not as inferior or less capable, 
but as a trusted and valued member of the body of Christ. At Lockwood, deacons are men who are called to be servant leaders who attend to the church's practical needs. That's in the bylaws. This refers to the official church office of deacon, but we have many deacons or servants who do not hold the official office of a deacon, and many of those are women. Lockwood would be in big trouble without the faithful women who serve here. So let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. That's Romans 14, 19. So when things are unclear or debatable, uh, we choose not to let that be a divisive uh, point for us, but uh, to not strive to make people happy, but to please God. Thanks. Jeff? Questions for Tim? <laughs> All right. So very, very briefly, a recap of LCC's vision is the church is committed to Christ, to Christ-likeness, to each other, and to the world. All right. So that is our, our foundational idea. Everything that happens in this church gets filtered through those things. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have fun. And in fact, we should, because one of those things is we're committed to each other. And so as a result of engaging each other in fun or serious discussion, we build up and become more of a community. So again, I, w I want to emphasize that when we make decisions here as a congregation, as these various boards, this is what we're considering as we move forward. So to expand on our, our vision, as Kevin has uh, clarified it for us, uh, what kind of church do we want to be? We want to be a church of prayer. Uh, we come, become a church of prayer by making prayer a priority and by praying for everyone. That includes each other. You want to pray for those closest to you, for other believers, both near and far, for the unsaved, uh, again, both uh, globally and specifically, if you have a friend who's unsaved, you should be praying for them by name and taking them before the Lord. And uh, for those in authority, even those you don't like or disagree with. Um, and be praying with a humble attitude. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may, we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want all people everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. We also want to be a church that's devoted to the scriptures. To do this, we study the Bible and obey the Bible and teach the Bible. We want to be a church that is loyal and committed to each other. Romans 12.10 says, Be do devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. We also want to be a church that shares the gospel with unbelievers. We've been commanded to preach the gospel to all creation. Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everyone needs Jesus. And we want to be a church full of people who are all in for Jesus. Matthew 16, 25 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
The rich young man in Matthew 19 wanted to follow Jesus, but would not let go of the world and turned back. But Jesus tells us, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So let's have eternal life as our inheritance. Um, in a minute here, I'm going to get to, Tim just said, what kind of church we want to be. I'm going to get to where do we want to go? What are our plans for the next year? So solid, concrete things that we want to do as a church. But before we get there, we've been talking about um, how, how the church structured elders, deacons, administration board. I just want you to know it's hard to be a leader. And, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, and not just for me, but, you know, it's impossible for, for leaders to make the right decision every single time. And so, as a church, please have, have grace and mercy um, with, with those people who have, who have taken those positions, not because they want to have authority, but because they're willing and they want to serve God, right? So, um, so, Pray for us as leaders, and if, you, if there is something that we did wrong, or if there's something that you don't agree with, please come and talk to the person or the group, you know, and probably it's a misunderstanding, or that they just need to change, or, or something, and we all have to be humble enough to do that, and so, um, and I, I promise you that if you come and talk to, to me or the elders, we'll listen, and um, if we've done wrong, we'll will change, okay? So as, as far as our plans for the church, and I'm thinking short term, um, one of the things that, that's primary as our goal is a, is a strong Sunday school program. I've told you that before. Um, we, had a, we had a pretty good Sunday school program a few years ago, at least lots of people were coming, um, and COVID changed that. You know, I, I don't know if I should say COVID did it, but it changed when COVID happened. Um, and so I, I, if we're going to be a people devoted to scriptures, we need to be learning them and we need to be trained for how to live them out. And so um, we're, we're going to try to re-up our Sunday school prog program and make it strong. So there's um, a new class that's going to be uh, starting for new believers and for people who just don't, they, they don't know the scriptures quite well, or that they, they feel like they don't know, or I'm up here preaching and they don't understand 90% of what I'm saying. We have a class for, uh, for them in room 303 starting on April 7th, um, and uh, taught by Brad and Julie Olson. It'll be um, going through how to grow as a, dis a disciple, what's the Bible really about, you know, all that stuff. We're going to continue the spiritual gifts class that Carl Rosh has been teaching, um, this is a great class after this one because you might be like, okay, I'm ready to dive in, but I don't even know where my place is or what my gift is. Go to that class and uh, be a part of that. That'll be down in the old fellowship hall in one of the classrooms. We have a, a woman's class that's been going on Hebrews, um, a great class for getting to know ladies and actually being in the word and talking together and discussion. Um, that's going to be continuing, and you can join in uh, even now. Um, on April 7th when it restarts. And then I will be starting a class in here on Genesis. It will be an in-depth kind of Bible study class, but it's going to be fun. Um, it'll be relaxed. It'll be kind of slow. We'll go through chapter by chapter and really try to soak in what the scripture is saying for us and the big picture and how it all relates to Christ. So that's those are the, the Sunday school classes we're starting. We got other ones in mind um, for things coming up, like a class for... Uh, parents and grandparents who, who want to see their kids come to Christ but don't know how to help them. Uh, things like that are coming up in the future, and we, we want to be um, deep in the scriptures as a church. Um, what are you offering the, the little children for Sunday school? Yeah, so Rosie said, what are you offering the little children for Sunday school? We're going to continue our Sunday school class um, for the children, and I'm going to get more toward children and youth here in a minute. 
So um, don't, don't worry about that. That's a big part of what we're doing. Um, we talked about praying as a church. It's easy to talk about praying. It's hard to actually make sure that we do it, <laughs> right? Um, we've had some people who are in our church who are, who are pushing that we become more of a praying church, and I love that. So like um, Margaret Muir leads on the first Sunday of the month right here in the, in the after second service, a uh, prayer time for the spiritual growth of our church. I lead on Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, a prayer group where we read a scripture and pray through it for our church, and we pray for the lost. Um, we, we need to be intentional. Do you know why? Because nothing good happens in church unless God's behind it, right? I mean, we can make all these plans, but unless God is behind it and we need to be praying for each other, for ourselves. Um, I've been talking about inviting people to Easter. I read a story recently of a preacher who he was getting tons of people were converting to Christ under his ministry and just seemed like every Sunday there were people coming up and being saved. And God spoke to him or gave him a vision or something. I'm not sure what it was. But he realized that it had nothing to do with him. And his preaching, it was this guy who would come, who was unschooled, illiterate, couldn't read, would come and sit on the steps by the pulpit and pray for people to come to Christ. And God was working through that man. We need to pray for the lost, for each other, that God would work through us. So we need to actually do things. So if you're able to come to prayer meetings like that, um, if you're able, maybe you're not, like those don't work with your schedule, maybe you could start another one for the church. Pray for specific people. Pray with people. Um, but I, we need to become a church of prayer. Um, another plan is to hire a youth pastor. And this has been a plan since I was hired. You know, I, I want to have a full-time youth pastor. We want to. Um, and we see that as important for our church. And let me tell you what's happening with that. So we started the process. We had a search committee of people who are... Um, Youth leaders, uh, a former youth group student who graduated, and a parent. And they looked and they sent out um, on churchstaffing.com and on colleges and all these things. And we got about 10 or 12 resumes. They narrowed it down, interviewed people, and they picked somebody that they wanted for the position. I offered him the job. Uh, uh, the elders um, also met with him via Zoom. Um, great guy. Uh, I offered him the job, and he said, please give me a week to pray about it. And then he called me back and with some questions. And it turns out he was trying to decide between us and another church. And then he said, As he asked for another week. So I gave him another week, and he called me back and said he, he chose the other church. And so we're starting over, and uh, we're sending out um, applications and resumes again, re-looking at um, applications and resumes from before and putting out new ones, and there's going to be some interviews this week for the youth pastor. We're hoping to hire um, one soon, and that we have the one that God wants. When I said that I was disappointed that this guy um, chose the other church, someone said, well, it's because God has something better for us, and for him, and I think that's true, and so we're, we're confident in the Lord with that. Um, one of the things that we need to do as a church is have a strong children's and youth program on Wednesday nights and Sundays. That's, that's a big deal to us. I'm sure it's a big deal to all of you, right? Um, I think things are going pretty well right now, actually, with our kids. Uh, if, if you ever come on Wednesday nights, it's alive in this, in this church. Like, there are kids everywhere. They're running around. They're having fun. We have a dinner that... Um, I'm so thankful. There's a lot of ladies who uh, put together and work really hard so that we can eat. Parents bring their kids, and then they can go right to church, and the parents have something. Um, Eric Kratz is doing a, a small group for the parents with, with little kids in the nursery. I'm doing Go Deep out here in the, the lobby for adults, and then we have a great program still going um, that Karen Justice has taken the lead over now, and so that's going well. Um, the Sunday mornings, we still need more volunteers. And um, I think it's going well, but like one time I went 
I was, it was Sunday school hour and I was up in the office when it first started for some reason. And I see um, Eliza Nottingham and Claudia Parker walking a, a row of 18 children <laughs> through the halls, all different ages. And uh, we only have one class for Sunday school. I think we need, and my hope is that we'll, we'll get more volunteers um, and get somebody who takes that on as a, as a, a role. Um, some other people have been helping recently, which has been good, um, but we need that. And I, I just want to say this, in general, I think all of us as a church need to be committed to our young people, um, to our teenagers and to our, our, our little ones, and give them the best we can. Because this, this generation, Generation Z and Generation A after them, the little ones, they are struggling. They really are, and the, the, the numbers just of them coming to church are incredibly low, um, but just with everything, they need Jesus. And so what they really need is people in their generation who are going to stand up for Christ and be leaders, and I want those, those people to be kids who are in our church who grow up loving Christ. And so we need to be committed to discipling, to evangelizing, to, to giving them every opportunity to know the Lord, sending them on mission trips, do, doing this or that, um, you know, hiring people who will um, look over them if that's what we need to do. Um, and, and when this generation becomes adults, there will be some strong ones that come out of this church, which is what I hope for. Strong believers who, who change the dynamic of the culture because they believe in Jesus so much. And so we need church leaders who are intentionally discipling others for ministry. I've told the elders this, and they obviously agree, and, and, but we, we need to be discipling men, both adults and young men. And I, one thing I really like is that's happening in Fire Shop, too. Um, our men are growing and getting stronger in this group that's meeting together on Thursday nights. Um, but it's happening in a lot of areas. But we need to do so even more. Um, one thing I'd like to do in the future is if there are young men who want to go into the ministry, I want to be available to train them and to help them go that way. If they feel called, we, sh- we should be the ones. Not sending them off, but you know, training them, building them up, making them ready, giving them opportunities. Um, one thing that's been mentioned in our church multiple times by multiple people, and I totally agree, is we need to be trained for evangelism. I, we need someone who um, can not just teach us how to do it, but give us the tools to make that happen. And that's, there, are, there are ideas that I have for making that happen, and I'm working on, um, but we don't have anything yet. Um, but there's... There's uh, different opportunities. I like to do something where we get some actual training and not some just more teaching so that we can go out and share the gospel with people. So that's one of my, one of my goals, but I don't have a concrete thing for it yet. Um, and then, you know, some churches focus on evangelism completely. And some churches focus on discipleship only. Those two things are supposed to go together. I mean, you can't, if you only have one and you don't have the other, it's, it's going to be a failure. And so eventually, maybe at the end of the year, maybe next year, I'd like to start what are called community groups. Community groups are, would be of people, a small group, where maybe three or four couples who are committed to Christ in, the church, in this church get together as leaders of a group and then invite people who are either unbelievers that they know from work or whatever, or maybe people who have just started coming to church and they need to be more involved, bringing them in to a program that's disciple, discipleship-oriented. Um, the, the, I actually already have a kind of a little program for it where it'd be focused on Jesus, how he lived, and what he taught. And you'd, you'd be learning together. You'd be meeting in homes, probably, of one of the people. And this would not be something that I'd probably start, everybody's doing this, but we'd start little at a time. Um, 
for those people who are willing to give it a try. I think that's the best way to evangelize to people who don't know Christ, to bring them into a community of Christ-following people who are all in for Jesus, to bring them into a friendship like that. I think that's the best way. And so, But I know there's other ways as well, and so we want to do them all. Um, you know, I want to mention this. Um, as covenant partners, uh, you're expected to be involved in the church. Um, and even as people who are not covenant partners, but who are committed to this church, you know, we want you to be involved, and I know a lot of you are. That being said, we can't do what our culture does and be over busy. Um, I have all these ideas, but if you're running ragged trying to do a bunch of church stuff and you don't actually have a good relationship with your family or with Christ, then you need to step back. And I just want to tell you that right now. So do what, what God has called you to do, not what everybody asks you to do. But if you see that God's calling you to do something like a community group or something like that, then go for it. Um, a couple more things. We need more elders and I think more deacons. And we have, we have asked one man. Um, there's a, in the bylaws, there's a six-month kind of training period for elders. Um, but we asked Scott Barrington to start training with us, and we have other people that we want to ask as well. We have a lot of great uh, men in this church who love the Lord, um, and we want to kind of decide uh, or see what God wants for that. But we need more leaders. We've got to have more fun together in my opinion. So I like that we're doing this good deeds auction. We do have a lot of fun, but I think we should have lots of fun. Um, and I'd like to connect more with our missionaries. And so one of the things we're going to do is have a missionary second week of April come in who we support, supported for a long time, but we're going to get to know him more through this. He's going to teach my Sunday school class that week. So, um, so those are things that are on my mind, um, on, our, on our agenda to do some of them are concrete, some of them are up in the air, but that's kind of the direction we want to go. Um, does anybody have a quick question about that? Yeah, Tori, just a minute. Sloan is running. Doing my best. Just for anybody that has any questions about what the deacons and the elders, the elders or the positions of them, they can find it in 1 Timothy 3 in the Bible. Read through it. It'll tell you what those positions are used for and what God expects from those people also. Yes, good. Thank you. There's one thing that Kevin has mentioned that every one of us can do, and that's pray. I challenge you to increase your praying for this congregation. Thanks, Margaret. I, I, just one other thing about prayer. Um, we have joined other churches in praying for our community, and that's very helpful for the, un, for the unsaved, but various aspects of the community that God would take hold of this uh, community. Uh, most people are not involved with Christ or with, with the, the churches. And so um, on the first Friday of every month, we have 15 people that have stepped up to take an hour and pray for our community. And I'm coordinating that, and we could use more. There are a lot of people who might be willing to do that, uh, to take an hour once a month to do that. Thanks, Phil. Linda. I just had an idea. There's thinking, the mic right there. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I had an idea. I was thinking, like, during your Bible study, we could take the first 15 or 20 minutes, break up in small groups, and maybe we could each group pray about something that's on your list of things that we need to work on and make better. So we could actually do that during your Bible study. Okay. Yeah. It's an idea. Yeah. All right, we'll do, uh... oh, geez. Okay, we got four minutes. So prayer has been brought up a lot this morning, and some of us feel like I do not know how to pray. Kevin mentioned fire shop, shameless plug, 6.30 in the barn. Um, this last Thursday and this coming Thursday, we actually talked about things that hinder our prayers. 
So if you struggle with praying, you might need to um, think about what is it that's standing in the way of you being a, a prayer. And us as men, we're told that the way we treat our wives is something that can hinder our prayers. So we're working on becoming the best husbands we can be, which will lead us into being better prayers. So that's the kind of stuff we do, and you're invited to come. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I wanted to reiterate something uh, that Kevin just said <clears throat> about the children's program. Uh, we are in urgent need of volunteers or helpers uh, in order to make the children's program excellent. That's our goal. Yes, it is. If you are a parent or a grandparent or a friend of uh, a friend of a person that has a child in the children's program, would you prayerfully consider not only sending your uh, child or grandchild to the program, but helping in some way? Your child is receiving a wonderful benefit from what the people are doing in King's Kingdom and in the Sunday School program. They're receiving a wonderful benefit, and I believe that you would be blessed by helping in the children's program. I, I want to say, too, it's, even if we had a great program, um, we need more than that. We need to personally invest in our kids. And so it's, that's a challenge to invest in our children and our teens. Thank you. Um, I was listening to Tim given the qualifications for the elders and the deacons through First Timothy. But I think there's one more qualification I would like to see added to it, and that comes from the book of Acts, chapter 6, where the seven deacons are being chosen to help serve the people. And that qualification is this. They must have been full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And I, those are, to me, the most two key things in serving. All right, last one. Uh, when we were talking, um, when people were talking about the prayer, um, I just had the thought that even Jesus' disciples asked him, like, teach us to pray. And I find excuses like, oh, I have to get my kids to be able to, you know, I can't come up here and pray, but I can easily ask a friend to pray with me and be intentional, like you said. So if you're struggling, like even the disciples <laughs> asked Jesus, like, show us how to pray, and there's clear, guy, you know, he did. He taught us how to pray, and we can be intentional and yeah, with a friend or family. We're all beginners, and yeah. So let me just conclude with this. Uh, we wanted to do this class because we thought it was important that we all be on the same page as a church and about what we believe, about who we want to be, about where we want to go. I want to live my life here on earth completely for Jesus, and I want to do it with you. And I don't want to go through the motions as a person. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be half-hearted. And I don't want to be a part of a church that is either. And so let's, if we're going to do this, let's do it. Let's do it the way that God is calling us to do it. Go all in. Seek the Lord with all we have. Let me pray for us. God, I pray that your spirit would be in this church in a more tangible way, Lord, that we'd see how you're working, that you'd speak to us, to our hearts, and not only to our minds. Lord, we offer ourselves to you. We give you our church, we give you our time, we give you ourselves, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody.